we're, we're going to turn to a conversation that that is uh, you know being very robustly had here in, in Washington these days, and it goes to really the fundamental um, capability of, of banks to operate, and that's capital. And, and not only capital such as it is, but also what does it mean for these institutions and their customers? What does it mean for the economy? Where, where have we been on the journey for the last 15 years? And um, uh, what kinds of, uh, of trade-offs uh, should we be thinking about? What kinds of impacts should we be thinking about? And as most of this audience would know, we've seen a lot happen over the last 15 years. We've had a lot of dramatic increases in capital. We've had a lot of dramatic increases in different types of measures to build up resiliency in the banking system. Uh, we heard Karen um, on the platform here just a few minutes ago making um, mention of some of those things. And they've been most profound uh, for, the, for the largest banks, the, the, you know, the GSIBs that make up the forum. And the requirements here in the United States have um, actually been even more robust than some of the standards that they, that they flow from. Uh, three times the CET1 capital made, um, are, you know, a requirement here in the United States. When you combine that to some of the other measures that have been put in place, it has provided for a, a pretty strong performance over time. And we see that performance tested um, in, in uh, the stress testing process. We've seen the performance tested in types of real world events such as the pandemic, uh, such as the events of this past spring. So there's been a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of opportunity to look at the performance of, of the institutions, the banking sector um, at large, but also the, you know, the largest institutions which are subject to the most stringent requirements. Recently, we've had um, prudential regulators propose the final elements of the post-crisis Basel changes, the Basel III finalization. And uh, as some of you know, that, um, that, you know, that's estimated to significantly increase capital uh, further on the order of 19, 20 percent for the, for the largest institutions uh, and, and requirements that go below the, the category one and the category two threshold as well. And, and some of those uh, in initiatives tie back uh, for some to the to the events of March. But uh, the the work that uh, that the that the Fed had been doing and uh, has culminated in this proposal was uh, you know that was occurring a long time ago um, you know off of the standard that came out in 2017. So um, there are some people here that can talk to this at at great length, um, and I want to introduce each of them. First of all, Randy Quarles, uh, who is the chairman of the Sinoja Group and was, as you know, the former vice chair of supervision, the first uh, statutorily confirmed uh, vice chair of supervision for the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Um, Sheriff Friedman is a chief accounting officer and controller for Goldman Sachs. And Doug Holtzeken is president of the American Action Forum. And, and Doug, uh, who is uh, you know, a, a thought leader in Washington on, on how policy interacts uh, with the economy, was also the director of the Congressional Budget Office and served as chief economist for the White House Council of Economic Advisors. And so what we'd like to do here this afternoon is talk about, um, um, you know, the variety of different issues that arise as, as a result of the capital framework that we have and the capital framework that we're, that we're examining right now. Uh, it's about the framework in terms of how much is enough. It's about what the changes might mean for industry uh, and for customers of the institutions and for the effects uh, of increases in capital in the broader economy. So uh, that's where we're going to try to go. And I think we've got um, about 50 minutes to get there, which is unfortunately not long enough, but maybe long enough for all of you. Um, let me start, Randy, with you. Let's talk about uh, something that has been studied and expounded on for quite some time, um, optimal capital. What's the, what's the optimal level of capital in the system right now? Uh, and, and how do you view from your current perch, from your former perch, um, you know, the trade-offs between increased safety and soundness, which um, is served by bank capital and, and the cost to the economy and, 
how do you think the U.S. banking system is doing in that regard? Where, where do we sit on the spectrum, in your opinion, right now? Uh, uh, so I'd say a few things about that. First, I think that it is important to recognize that there is a trade-off uh, between safety and dynamism in setting bank capital levels. There are, uh, I mean, there are a lot of academics, not many outside of the academic sphere, but there are a lot of academics across the political spectrum who, uh, who reject that, at least at the levels that we're talking about now, and believe that capital could be, be increased significantly without any cost to uh, the ability of the system to support the economy. I myself think that is a sort of insufficiently uh, nuanced application of, uh, of Medigliana Miller, which is a you know, brilliant heuristic to help us think about the world, but it is not actually a description of the world. And therefore, outside of academia, you, know, you, you would have to conclude uh, that raising capital can make the system safer, but it does not, uh, but it comes at a cost. The second thing uh, that I'd say is that recognizing that um, in determining where you should set the capital level, recognizing that it comes at a cost but that it can make things safer, you shouldn't try to set it so that no bank can fail. The purpose of the whole Basel III regime, the whole post uh, great financial crisis effort uh, to improve bank regulation was not to create a regulatory system in which no bank could fail, but to create a regulatory system in which any bank could fail. That was expressly the objective, was to get rid of too big to fail, to allow any institution to be able to fail. You had to have a system that, that could do that. It was not to say that no bank can fail, and therefore the failure of a bank, or two, or three, uh, if it does not lead to widespread financial instability, is not an example of a failure of the regulatory system. It is an example of the success of that objective of the regulatory system. Uh, I think the third thing then I would say is, you know, where does the US stand if you're going to say, well, you have to have a system in which any bank could fail and there are costs and benefits to additional capital. Uh, I think most people in this room are probably familiar with the various efforts that have been made uh, to estimate what that optimal level of capital is. Uh, the Basel Committee uh, years ago came out with uh, perhaps the first of these sorts of studies. Most people uh, these days refer to two, the Bank of England uh, study and the Fed study. The Bank of England study concluded that the you know, that the proper, you know, that the optimal level of capital considering costs and benefits uh, was from 10 to 14 percent uh, of, of uh, uh, tier one capital. Uh, the Fed study concluded that the optimal level of capital was from 13 to 25 percent. Um, there's a little bit of uncertainty as to how you would then translate those capital measures to CET1 capital, which is what we would generally look at today. Uh, uh, many of you are probably familiar with uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis study. Uh, which seems to go up every time they do one, <coughs> but, um, you know, but has concluded that the optimal <laughs> level of capital is multiples uh, of those numbers. Uh, and without, uh, these are, again, like Medigliana Miller, these are useful, uh, looking at these studies, are really helpful in uh, sort of clarifying how to think about the world, but they are not descriptions of the world because the difference among all of these studies really the fundamental difference depends on the degree of resilience that you're trying to obtain, which at the end of the day is a, is a political choice as opposed to a technocratic choice. So for example, the Bank of England study assumes that the system has to be prepared to absorb a shock of the size of the great financial crisis. And it therefore concludes that you will have, that, that you need 10 to 14% tier one capital the system as a whole in order to do that. The Federal Reserve study assumes that you, will have a, you need to be prepared for a larger shock, uh, roughly 50% larger, I think it was. Uh, and that leads to, surprise, surprise, roughly 50% more tier one capital that you need. The uh, Minneapolis studies assume that you need to be prepared for a shock that was multiples of the size uh, 
of the great financial crisis. And so you need multiples of the level of tier one capital. But all of this is simply saying, all of these you know, technical studies are simply saying, well, if this is the sort of thing you like, then you will like this sort of thing. Um, not that there's any uh, sort of compelling reason to prefer one level of capital over another on the basis of these studies. So where does that leave us in determining whether the current level of capital is, uh, is appropriate or not? Well, you mentioned them in your opening, uh, uh, in your opening statements. We did go through a fairly severe test of the bank capital system during the COVID event. Uh, and while the degree of fiscal support that was provided to the economy meant that the losses that could have been expected never rolled up into the banking system, we were running stress tests throughout that period, assuming that there would be no additional fiscal support from the very beginning, from the first stress test. During that period, we ran roughly seven stress tests, uh, each of them assuming that there would be no additional fiscal support beyond the point at which we were running that stress test. And the banking system survived all of those stress tests. If the worst had happened, we still would have had a, a uh, resilient system, given the level of capital that obtained at that time. Um, if you, um, so, uh, so you put all that together, and I would say that with the limitations of the studies that are out there, they are nonetheless a good way of helping us think about the world. Uh, and they would say that to respond to a crisis of the level of the great financial crisis, which was the uh, most significant financial crisis that we have experienced in our lifetimes uh, and that has, been, uh, that has obtained in not quite a century, uh, that you would need, according to the Bank of England study, 10 to 14% capital. Well, we've got 12.5% capital in the United States right now. Uh, if you, you, you have the experience of the COVID event saying, well, testing it repeatedly during a significant stress shows that we had enough capital. Uh, so I think that it is reasonable to assume that the system is at an optimal level of capital now and <clears throat> materially increasing the level of capital in the system will result in a cost to economic dynamism. Uh, thank you. Um, Doug, talk about that. Talk about the sensitivity of the economy <coughs> to financial policy and regulation um, and, you know, what happens as the pendulum swings. Um, you know, give, give us a sense of what your observations are about that. Sure. Um, th th first of all, thanks for the chance to be here and uh, the chance to hear someone balance costs and benefits, which <laughs> doesn't happen as much as I would like in, in thinking about policymaking. And, and on regulation in particular, I think there's uh, too little attention paid to its impact on the economy. And uh, one of the things we do at the American Action Forum is we read everything that comes out of the Federal Register. Um, we use interns. We damage them forever, but it's okay. <laughs> um, and and we, we take at face value what the agencies report as the, as the cost imposed on you, the private sector, of this, of this regulation, and we track that. And... Um, to my great astonishment, during the eight years of the Obama administration, uh, there was a self-inflicted burden of $890 billion of regulatory costs, over $100 billion a year of essentially stealth taxes on the U.S. economy and without much recognition that this was going on. You heard a lot of chatter in that period about how, you know, terrible recovery from the Great Recession, not enough fiscal stimulus must be it. Well, we're throwing up a pretty big headwind every year. And um, I thought we'd never sort of do that again. Uh, the Biden administration has been very, very busy and is way ahead of the pace of the Obama administration. It's already imposed $426 billion of regulatory costs, $21 billion in financial services already. Um, and there's not any real recognition that this could have a large macro consequence and harm the growth path of the U.S. economy. And, and I worry about insufficient recognition of the economic costs of, of what we're up to in general and in, in the bank capital uh, area in particular, because I, I want to just, you know, concur with Randy on the on the real world test that was the pandemic. We, one of the things that happened during that period is, you know, we had this huge response in the CARES Act, and we did the household stuff, and we did the Paycheck Protection Program, 
And we had $500 billion for the Main Street Lending Program, which was supposed to help the larger firms who are served by your, your banks. And it, it never did anything. And I remember at the time saying, oh, well, we've designed it wrong. And it, you know, I was among many people who, who had real uh, concerns about how they're doing it. I think it, with the, the benefit of hindsight, you know, the banks were in good shape and they were serving their customers. And their customers saw no reason to go to this, this, this Main Street Lending Program. So, you know, that's a real world test of the adequacy of the capital, the ability of, of the banks, particularly the financial sector in general, to weather an event of that scale. No one talks about 2020 as the year of a banking crisis or a financial crisis. It, it was an enormously successful period in my view. And so I worry now about um, going further because you know, that seems to me to you know, run the test. Why would we want more? We're starting to get into costs without, without benefits to, to balance them. <clears throat> Do you worry about pockets or sectors or, um, uh, you know, and, and the duration of, of um, the imposition of a, reg of, of a regulation in this, in this case we're talking about? How do you sort of connect it to, you know, sectors of the economy that you think are critical for growth, for example? Well, we, we know, for example, that um, if you uh, really limit the financial capabilities, uh, you're going to limit the success of venture capitalists who have relied heavily on, on access to those funds to fund startups, innovations, and, and the things that we rely so much on. Uh, we, we saw a little example of that with uh, the Silicon Valley, which um, was, was a, a little test case by itself. And, and I, you know, that, that is the, the, the central piece of, of growing more rapidly in the future is, is those innovations. And they have to be financed. And if you Make it too expensive to finance things, you'll, you'll pay that price. And, and that's the leading edge of it, uh, almost always. And, and so right now, th that's my, one, one of my big concerns. Uh, the other thing we know is that if you go back to the brick and mortar world, the most uh, um, uh, sort of financial conditions sensitive sector is housing. And we have an affordable housing crisis in the United States. We need more, not less, you know, in lots of locations. And uh, everything that is happening in this Basel III uh, uh, proposal is aimed right at housing finance. And so it's not going to arrive in, at this incident, but it might arrive just when they're finally getting their, getting their, their businesses back. And, and I, I'm really a little bit worried about that right now. Okay. <clears throat> um, Shira, let's talk about, um, I mean, we, there's a lot of focus on credit and credit provision. I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you think the financial markets are functioning now in, you know, in the years after, uh, and, and really still kind of processing, if you will, some of the post-crisis regulation. Can you, can you talk about the calibration of bank capital, uh, how it's affected um, you know, the work that your firm does in a variety of different ways? Sure, happy to, and, and again, thank you for hosting this and, and all the panels today. Um, I think that there's been a lot of really important discussion. You know, I, I think as you think about the post-crisis reforms, starting with the original Basel III, um, the CCAR stress test into uh, your stress capital buffer, and uh, the current Basel III endgame proposal, all of them have one consistent theme, which is that capital markets-related activities sit in the crosshairs of where the most strict capital requirements are coming to pass. And so whether it's the global market shock, um, which is a shock to your, all of your trading book instantaneously as part of the CCAR stress test, or within the Basel III endgame, if you look at the fundamental review of the trading book, so the market risk rules, or CVA, or the rules surrounding secured financing transactions, all of them continue to, after you know, learning from the financial crisis, really think about and focus on the capitalization um, within capital markets related activities. Um, and so, so the question that we have to ask ourselves is what's the consequence of that? And we've seen that consequence. We've seen more and more activity move into the shadow banking sector where you know, uh, institutions like Citadel and Virtu are the second largest player in the equities markets today. Um, and so you see activity moving into the shadow bank um, the shadow bank being a, a non-crisis tested um, sector. Um, you see banks withdrawing or consolidating activities. And so we've gone from having dozens of companies, uh, banks that engage in clearing on behalf of clients, now to really just a handful. 
And so, so the issue with the Basel III endgame in its proposed form is it continues to increase the capital requirements specifically for capital market related activities. And when you think about ingenuity, I agree with you on the venture capital point, but similarly, capital markets is the, is the transparent, liquid way in which risk and product moves around this country and around the world. And the US capital markets in particular is an, is an enviable asset relative to other jurisdictions who are looking to create something similar. Um, and, and this will um, certainly abate that. And uh, again, <laughs> you, you've talked a little bit about the migration. What about just the performance of the, of the markets as well? I mean, we, we, we observed some dislocation during, uh, during 2020, during the pandemic. Um, how do you how do you analyze the sort of the root causes of that sort of activity or or dysfunction? Sure, um, you know both of my colleagues here have referenced the pandemic, and in the pandemic, you saw dislocation. Name the market, and there was a dislocation. And and you could look at the pandemic. You could look at the Russia Ukraine war in terms of what played out in the commodities market. Um, you know, there's or uh, in the emerging markets uh, currency market, and so there's there's lots of spaces where you see that dislocation come to pass. And, and that's why when you look at the banks and the market making um, within those banks that exist today, why it's so critically important that the banks stand ready, as they did at the start of the pandemic, as they did at the, with the Russia-Ukraine war, as they did even with the regional banking crisis earlier this year, in order to transact on behalf of clients, in order to help those clients hedge their risk. So let's recast everything we've just gone through over the last three years and do it through the lens of the Basel III endgame in its proposed form. Are banks really gonna stand ready to take um, different locational commodity risk as Russia invades Ukraine when there's a risk that those, um, that those points become illiquid and then you're subject to non modelable risk factors in the fundamental review of the trading book? where something that you have capitalized to X, you now need to capitalize to multiples of X. Um, or similarly, within CVA, during the pandemic, lots of counterparties wanted to hedge, corporates wanted to hedge their, their risk associated with interest rates, associated with commodities. And so they went to the banks to do that. Corporations generally hedge on a non-margin basis, and oftentimes those trades are long dated including CVA, as it's written in the proposal, would increase the RWAs associated with those transactions tenfold. And so the question, again, that you have to ask yourself is, who's gonna bear the cost of that? Are the banks gonna bear that cost, or are the banks gonna pass that cost to the corporates? And then are the corporates gonna pass that to their clients, such that if Southwest Airlines wants to hedge their uh, nat gas risk, um, ultimately your ticket prices go up as a result. <clears throat> I mean, Randy, how did you sort of reckon, um, you know, as you as you were processing this package? Because you, you you did get a chance to spend some time on it while you were there, but it got uh, it got deferred by this pandemic that we keep talking about. So, uh, you know, how did you sort of look at the potential um, uh, kind of mismatches between you know risk and 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 reward in terms of how this might be designed? Well, um, you know, I, 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 think, uh, I think the remaining uh, elements of the Basel III package uh, are useful elements to have in a comprehensive capital framework. They create uh, uh, good incentives um, uh, for uh, behavior for the banks, um, and, uh, but they have to be thought about in the context of the overall level of capital and the overall framework as opposed to each individually. So for there to be a capital charge against operational risk, I mean, maybe that's a, you know, that may be somewhat conceptually controversial, but, uh, you know, appropriately calibrated, that makes sense. Certainly a capital charge against uh, uh, trading risk as, as the last element to be put in. But particularly in the United States, we had supercharged some of the previously implemented capital rules to reflect the fact that these rules had not yet been put in place, and they would eventually, and in some cases we expressly said, we will therefore go back and revisit these early calibrations when the entire framework uh, has been implemented. So 
so in my time at the Fed, as we considered the package of, for implementing the Basel III endgame, as we called it, uh, I was told when I walked in the building that I was not allowed to call it Basel IV <laughs> for some reason that, you know, that, that was right out. Um, so Basel III endgame. Um, and mostly in part of, as part of looking at it comprehensively was, all right, well, what are some of these other measures in the overall framework that now that we have these last two elements, we can turn down both to reflect that we're not double counting certain types of risk uh, and to reflect uh, going back to the, to the first uh, subject that we talked about, that the overall level of capital in the system is about right. We don't want to increase the aggregate level of capital in the system as part of improving the framework to ensure that there are appropriate capital charges against different types of, uh, of activity. So, you know, I think that it would be, you know, I think that it would have been sensible to have an implementation framework that expressly adjusted some of these other measures kept the overall uh, uh, sort of aggregate capital increase from the implementation of Basel III to you know, single digit percentage increases as opposed to close to 20%, uh, reflecting, okay, this is something that's sensible to do, but the overall level of capital is about right for all the reasons that we talked about earlier, and we certainly don't want to be uh, sort of undermining the ability of the system to, uh, uh, to support the real economy. I, the last thing I'd say about that, which you, have to think about, and I didn't mention in the, in, in our first, in, as in response to the first question, the banking system is only one part of the overall financial system. So as you think about calibrating capital requirements for the banking system, you also have to take into account is, are you really making the overall financial system safer if you super calibrate capital requirements in the banking system, or are you simply forcing certain types of activity, generally what you by definition must think is the, is the riskiest activity because you put the highest capital charge in it out of the banking system and into some other part of an integrated financial system uh, into which you have less visibility, uh, which generally will have less capital, uh, less uh, resilience, less supervision, less uh, automatic ability of the official sector to respond when there is disruption in it. You're, you're not necessarily making the system safer by over, by supercharging capital requirements in banks. You have to take all of that into account in setting the right level. Um, so, Shira, I want, I want, I want you to remark, uh, comment on, on you know, what Randy was unpacking, which is sort of the, kind of the, the panoply of existing bank capital requirements and, and the position that you're in right now. How do you, you, know, how do you sort of you know, deal with these um, seemingly uh, sequentially implemented and disconnected components and make it all work in an organization as complex as, as yours? Alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that we have any yet. <laughs> Available at uh, 4.30. <laughs> um, part, part of the beauty of, of the regulation that transpired um, while you were in charge was you champion for simplicity you put all the requirements together into one ratio and told the banks manage to that ratio. And, and um, although it was complicated and you know, supervision remained robust and challenging, um, it, was, it was a more simplified approach. You know, if you read the Basel III um, NPR, um, we now have three ratios again, although two don't really, I think, matter for really any bank. Um, but again, you'll still have to go through the rigor of producing those ratios and reporting on them. And, and, and all, all the work that goes around there. Um, and so, you know, what, what we do at Goldman Sachs, and I know from talking to my counterparts at the other peers, um, is we put as much um, resources around it, so whether that's human capital as well as technology, um, in order to help support the calculations. You know, as an example, we've had um, over 50 engineers working for the last five years on fundamental review of the trading book. Um, in order to build out that process, recognizing we now only have uh, two years uh, in order to implement that and, and um, you know, need to have the regulators come in to review those models. And so I think, I think a lot of it is about being very front-footed um, on, on what's included in the rules. Um, and it, sometimes you run the risk of inefficiency that you build something that may not come to pass but I think that's, that cost is worth it relative to uh, making sure that you're prepared. 
Um, to the point you know, that Randy talked about on recalibration, um, the, you know, the, the <coughs> things that are more frustrating when you look at the NPRs is there's very obvious ways in which the rules could be recalibrated um, in a more um, appropriate fashion. As an example, within GSIB, um, in the original GSIB final rule, it says that the coefficients will be calibrated, will be recalibrated based upon economic growth, because economic growth itself is not an indicator of change in systemic importance. And that rule was put out in 2014, and obviously the world has grown, and all of the GSIB's GSIB surcharge, you know, surcharges have increased in part as a result of that. And so here you had the issuance of an NPR where you could, where the Federal Reserve, in theory, could have easily recalibrated the coefficients. Um, potentially reducing the size of the GSIB surcharge for the banks. Um, and and that, that piece wasn't touched, nor was it explained why it wasn't touched. Um, and that's why conversations like the one we're having today are so important. Well, we, and, and we observe um, that, the, that the requirements and the capital that flow from them have continued to sort of you know, ramp up. And if you, if you did nothing today, you just continue to see that um, um, elevation, whether it's as a consequence of the framework or a consequence of the economy, as you just cited. Um, so you have that sort of built into the system already. Um, you know, Doug, you've done some work on this issue with your colleagues. I mean, what are your specific observations about, the, about this particular proposal? And um, you know, its potential impact on the economy. And, and one other thing that we talked about earlier in, in the program, we had Secretary Commerce here talking about just overall competitiveness of the United States abroad. And maybe we can talk to specific aspects of the disparities that sometimes we see in the way jurisdictions implement this. But just talk about sure. what you see from the proposal and, 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 and what you kind of how you play out the um, you know, the effects if, if something if something similar to this were to go forward. Right. Well, uh, since I have no original thoughts, let me flag two things that my my co-panelists have said. I mean, the, the first, in terms of just the internal structure of this um, and, and where things flow away from the banks, it looks like you know uh, housing mortgage risk, which historically is the risk that has generated the most systemic problems, is going to flow to the GSEs who hold the lease capital. And that seems like an unwise outcome uh, for, the, for the US. And so I, I worry about that um, and, and what that will mean, not just for the, the housing sector, which I, I think is, is facing an extremely difficult uh, period over the next couple of years, but for the, the larger issues of managing that risk, which is now residing on the treasury and, and the taxpayer. And, and it's a, not a place we wanted it, right? You want that backed by private capital somehow. So I, that's a particular piece of, the, of this proposal that I've, I've got my eye on. And, and then there's, there's the broader competitiveness issue. I, you, know, you worry narrowly, I well, shouldn't say it that way to you since these are your banks, about the banks, right? They're, they're important um, pieces, pieces of global competitiveness and this disadvantages them, other things being the same. But, but as Sheer mentioned, you, you have big impacts on US capital markets, which have historically been one of our greatest advantages. The depth and liquidity of U.S. capital markets is unmatched, and to damage that in, in any way, I think, is, is really unwise at this point in time. Um, uh, we want to always be able to attract uh, capital and activity into the United States. It's an increasingly competitive world, and uh, it's going to get more so, not less. And so, th those are two things that that sort of come out of this, um, uh, and they both look like uh, unforced errors, and that's the troubling part. The one thing I would add to your comments, just because you specifically mentioned Europe, is you know, if you look at today without the impact of the Basel III endgame, one of the metrics we look at is the density of your risk-weighted assets. And you could think about that as RWAs divided by your balance sheet. Generally, all balance sheets are calculated the same. We use US GAAP. Internationally, they use IFRS. But for all intents and purposes, it's around the same. In the US today, the, the risk weight density for banks is about 50%. And so take Goldman Sachs as an example, we have about 650 billion RWAs over a one and a half trillion dollar balance sheet. In Europe today, that number stands at less than 30%. And so that means if I hold the exact same asset in the United States versus in Europe, generally I'm holding 50 cents on the dollar in risk weight in capital, 
versus um, in Europe where I'm holding 30 cents on the dollar. And that's before you get to the buffers and the fact that under GSIB, European banks are on method one, in the US we're on method two, or the fact that in the US we capitalize every single day for our peak to trough loss, which is not part of the minimum requirement in most other jurisdictions. And some of this is a function of internal versus standardized models as well. Correct. Right? Right. And in, in Europe, in most cases, including in the Basel III endgame, um, they're allowed to continue to use models versus in the US, where it's proposed that we cannot. No. Um, so, Randy, you, you um, not only served as a vice chair of supervision, but you were, you were at the Financial Stability Board, and you, you, know, you had a um, you know, particular vantage point, if you will, and, and, and what she was talking about in terms of some of the, the differences in the way that the requirements are implemented um, uh, in, amongst the European banks, which you know, we're talking about not the EU specifically, but UK, EU, Switzerland. Um, you know, we, we, have, we observe that there is a disparity. Um, can, you, can you speak to that? I mean, how do you, how do you think about the way that we have done it here? How do you, and, and, and the way that um, our, our, our institution's competitors do it, and what it, you know, what's the meaningfulness of that? Um, well, so I, I, I would say, you know, this is, a, this is a disparity and an issue that has existed for a long, long period of time. At a, at a 50,000 foot level, I've always thought of, of Basel II, uh, the previous sort of uh, international effort to uh, sort of regularize uh, international capital as a way of trying to level the playing field between US and Europe by creating a framework in which the US could lower capital levels to those of Europe. And uh, Basel II had barely been put in place when we had the great financial crisis, and that Basel III is effectively a way of trying to level the playing field uh, between the US and Europe by requiring the Europeans to raise their capital levels to those of the US. Uh, and that was not, you know, it, there remained a difference uh, after the early implementation of Basel III. I think over the course, again, kind of pre-2020, uh, uh, you know, uh, through 2021, it was narrowing. Um, and it was narrowing, I think, principally because the European stress testing uh, processes were getting more rigorous. Um, a, a principal reason for our greater uh, uh, density of risk-weighted assets is because of our stress testing. Uh, if you sort of look at the capital frameworks themselves, they say, well, they're really quite similar. They're, you know, shouldn't they be the same? Uh, but we had a much higher density of risk-weighted assets, uh, largely because of our stress testing, and the Europeans got more serious about stress testing over the years. Uh, but I think that's reversing with this implementation of Basel III. The Europeans, particularly, uh, driven by the French, uh, do not want capital uh, to be going up on the grounds, per, not unfairly, given, as, as you would guess <coughs> from the comments that I've already made, that there is probably enough capital in the system. The capital in the system is about right for us, for them. So they don't want capital to be going up, and they're seeking to implement Basel III in a way that doesn't cause their capital to increase. We're increasing our uh, sort of through the cycle capital levels substantially, and that's even ignoring uh, sort of the uh, increased intensity of the stress tests in the United States, which will not be matched now by increased intensity of the stress tests in Europe that will further uh, increase that gap. So I think the gap had been closing gradually over the years in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, uh, and it's now widening again quite rapidly. So, you know, from a we're operating on the playing field standpoint. What does that share? What does that mean? What does that, you know, what does that do to institutions here who are operating there and vice versa? I mean, can you, can you shed any light on that? So we can't move our headquarters to Paris. That's, that's not a choice. Yep. Um, so, so, um, so, so we are here and, and they are there and, and even they admit that uh, their, their capital rules including the Basel III endgame, are less onerous than what we have here. And so what we work through is across each of the markets and products and clients that are impacted by the NPR, which is all of them, what's going to happen as a result. And so I mentioned earlier CVA as an example. 
And so to the extent um, we are going to be required to hold more capital against those trades, in addition to SACR, in addition to CCAR stress losses, um, we're going to pass that cost on to the end users. And so as you think about financial stability, um, what do those end users do? And so it, some could say the end users will go to the unregulated, um, although my personal view is that's less likely because I don't know that their boards are going to be comfortable with them facing non-banks and non-GSIBs. Um, but they go either path A, they go to the unregulated, and then the question is, in crisis, are the unregulated there? Um, and, and that's never been tested, and, and there's been papers and research put out, including by Basel, saying unlikely um, that they'll be there in time of stress. Um, number two is they absorb that cost, and if you take a company like Mars as an example, which is, um, it, which is um, an end user but also is not publicly listed, um, you'll not only have an increase in capital because of CVA, but you'll have an increase in capital because of their risk weight since they're not publicly traded and you need to be publicly traded to be deemed investment grade. And so what Mars can do is charge more for your Snickers bar. Um, and I'd like to see the public's reaction if that comes to pass. And then in my view, the worst case of the three is, and I'm not picking on Mars or Southwest Airlines or any of these other corporates, they choose not to hedge. And we've started to hear rumblings from clients in that regard, where they'll, they'll just own the commodity, the rate, the currency risk. And I suspect, in my opinion, that's the worst case scenario, because then you've got risk sitting with various corporations that are not experts in that risk. And we've all seen when markets dislocate, you know, to your earlier question, how rapid things can move, whether it's in the interest rate space or in the commodity space, um, and whether or not these corporations, including pensions, because in the NPR, pensions or corporations, um, are prepared to deal with this. So that's a pretty interesting list of clients. Um, and, and, and yeah, go ahead. Sort of add something to that, which is, I'm sympathetic to the, the notion that you should be very um, attentive to financial stability because Without telling us, business cycles changed in the 21st century. In the 20th century, they were largely income events. But if you think about the dot-com bubble, it originated in uh, financial markets, and then we went to the Main Street economy. Great uh, recession starts in financial markets, hits the Main Street economy. And so the, the notion that you should be really careful about financial stability makes a lot of sense to me. But neither of those kinds of risks relied on the banks. Like, the, the, the housing is largely in, in non-banks now. And so we are shoring up the financial stability for the people who are not the problem. And instead, making Snickers bars more expensive and hurting the innovation in the chocolate business. I, mean, I, I don't like that. <laughs> um, let me um, open it up to the audience, if I could. If, if there are questions um, you know, from the audience, be happy to be happy to entertain. Okay, all right, um, all right. So, so Randy, what do you, what do you ask, what do you, what do you think is the, um, you know, we have we have a comment period that that is uh, going to close in November, and then we have a lot of work. I mean, what's, what what is the, what, what do you think is the sort of the pathway, if you will, towards something of this scale? Um, you know, what will happen after the, after the comment period closes, and and. Every, everybody has their chance to kind of, you know, you know weigh in. What, what's the, what's the mo inside, you know, the agencies in terms of proceeding, uh, given your experience? Um, well, it'll be interesting if it uh, if it proceeds in the same way. The the, you know, the Fed and the banking agencies generally, but especially the the Fed is very serious about taking comments into account. I mean, often, I mean, this is also is a little bit of a cartoon, but it's not a, it's one grounded in some truth, at least. Uh, there is a, you know, there, there's a certain ethos in many regulatory agencies that, okay, well, we have to do as little as possible. You know, we are required by law to take the comments into account, but we know what we want to do, and we'll just, and, you know, uh, and it's mostly formulaic. The Fed is pretty serious about looking at the comments and, and taking them into account. You know, I think it will be, 
you know, and then there will be a lot of internal discussion. The public meeting uh, in which the NPR was proposed, uh, I think, evidenced that you know, there was a majority of the Fed board that had some serious questions uh, about the proposal that they will, you know, and then they'll be looking at the comments in order to see how those questions could possibly be uh, addressed. <coughs> and, uh, and, and that also is a little, you know, that, that makes it a little more difficult to tell what's going to happen as a result of the comment process because usually there's been more work done in advance to ensure that the NPR that is put out uh, is pretty strongly supported by a majority of the board and it was clear that this NPR, you know, people were okay with it being proposed but they, the majority of the board had some serious questions about it. So that makes it a little less clear how the, you know, what a final rule would look like or how long it would take it to come out. Okay, okay. Um, Doug, one more, one, one more question for you. If you, um, you know, if you sort of place this, you know, in the, in the broader context of, and you, and you talked about this a little bit for, before, the, um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of activity going on right now um, how do you how do you sort of you know think about the you know the, the impacts of major changes in you know bank regulation along with the other things you may you may be seeing from other departments and agencies? I mean you've got a I mean you you sort of focus on this exclusively. So I mean what is your what what is your overall take? Um, you know how do you how, how do you how do you try to dimension um, impacts on the economy of you know a, a variety of disparate changes and 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 in how they come together or or and, and and where does it where does it sort of take us? So for me, everything leads to the pace of trend growth. Uh, the pace of trend growth in the 20th century was such that the standard of living doubled every 35 years. So roughly one working career standard of living would double. That was people's access to their version of the American dream. Mm -hmm. In this century. Uh, the standard of living is doubling every 70 years. And there's this palpable sense of access to the American dream disappearing over the horizon. And so the, 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 the first order trade-off is, what are we giving up in growth to do this? And, um, and, and I think we've given up too much in, over, over the course of the, the past couple decades. And so um, I look at um, what's going on right now across all of the agencies, and I think about these, these burdens imposed on the private sector, the growth consequences of them, versus other ways we might go at this, whether legislatively um, uh, to, to get, the same, get the same outcomes in a, least cost, in a less costly fashion. The, the reality is that it is difficult for the agencies to coordinate on their macro impacts. They, they, there's just no mechanism for that. And in principle, there is one in the Congress and in the legislative. It's not particularly functional at the moment, but you know, on paper, it's there. And we can think about you know, budgets and, and, and what are we going to do in the way of headwinds to growth from the, the policies and, and, and evaluate those trade-offs. I don't think we're evaluating them right now. And in this uncoordinated fashion, we're, we're harming the growth outlook. Yeah. Um, Shira, we talk, uh, I want you to uh, get in one more comment about trade-offs, because I do think it, it, is, it is sort of at the you know, it's, it, it's the very thing that I think is, is most important to consider uh, when you're looking at what are legitimate benefits uh, to, to changes that are being made and then costs that um, you know, may, may exceed those benefits and have we thought about that. And when you're talking to your clients um, about the kinds of things that you are anticipating and what it means for them, how do, you, how, do you, how do you sort of explain this and, 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 and delve into the rationale and, and how you want them to be thinking about it pri primarily? Because you know, we, we, we tend to think about the impact on banks, but it's not about the banks. It's, it's, it's really more about the customers. It's the, the providers of mortgages, the first generation home uh, buyer, for example, or, or you know, the, the company that's making this, 
judgment about whether to hedge as, as it normally would or not. I mean, what is what advice are you giving your clients right now as 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 you start to process this? Sure, um, great question. I, I think that you know the the most important call to action right now is really educating clients and end users and government and constituents and Congress as it relates to the second order and third order effect associated with what's embedded within this um, NPR. Um, because I think a lot of people dismiss it as, okay, so the banks are gonna have to hold more capital, or so, okay, fine, capital markets, which sounds like some voodoo thing where banks and hedge funds make money, is gonna become you know, less liquid, that doesn't affect me. And so you know, what we try to champion for is making it much more transparent to the end users in terms of who gets impacted by that. So as an example, you know, corporations today fund three quarters of their, of, of their debt via the capital markets in the United States. It's less than 30% in Europe where banks just hold those assets on their balance sheet. And so when you think about more capital for capital markets activities, the cost for corporations to fund themselves go up. Or when you think about more capital for illiquid inventory, for illiquid inventory um, the municipal market is a market that can go illiquid pretty quickly in mm -hmm. secondary trading. And so, as an example, LaGuardia funded itself through, you know, the, the LaGuardia upgrade, and I'm not opining on how we think about that, it's for a separate panel, um, was funded via the municipal market. And tr transacting in secondary trading and municipal securities in a fundamental review of the trading book world is, is just too dangerous of a thing to do. And so it's, and, and, and pensions as well, you know, not being able to earn the returns that they earn and that they've anticipated that they're going to earn, bold underscore, um, is, is the things that every person really needs to be concerned about as you think about the Basel III endgame. Okay. Right. Um, I want to thank all of you. Uh, this has been a really good conversation and uh, hopefully it's been on. Uh, eye-opening you know, for, for, our, for our audience. And uh, thank each and every one of you for, for taking time to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.